Hey guys, welcome back to the Psalms of God podcast. This is your host, Ree, and today's episode is on powerful water creatures. Now, when I started out planning this episode, I really wanted to focus in on the Leviathan. If you are familiar with the story of Job, particularly Job chapter 41, then you are familiar with the Leviathan. It is a massive beast of a creature that lives in the ocean and is immensely powerful. Um, When God is talking to Job, he is like, who can tame this beast? Can you do this? Can you know, can you slay this beast? Can you tame it? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, And it's not really talked about a lot within Christian circles, but there's actually a lot of history and a lot of uh, lore and legend around this creature, it, particularly if you start looking at Jewish sources. And, you know, I thought it was interesting because it doesn't only appear in Job 41. It appears elsewhere in Job. It also appears in a psalm. And I believe it appears in the book of Isaiah as well. And so I was wondering if other cultures had a history of some sort of sea monster, sea creature type of a thing. So I started looking into that specifically. And I gotta say, um, it was a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. Obviously, when it comes to sea creatures, the first thing that came to my mind after the Leviathan was the Loch Ness Monster. Um, You know, I'm pretty sure you already heard of the Loch Ness Monster. Um, There is a great deal, I guess, of history pertaining to it, its first sightings, um, which were actually pretty recent in history. I don't remember the exact date that I found when I was looking up the history of the Loch Ness Monster, but, you know, there is a whole history of people faking photographs, people... Uh, claiming that they've seen things. People will still report to this day that there is something there. Um, As I was doing research, I came across an article where people were studying, supposedly they were studying something else, but we all know, um, as someone who's been in research, if you can double dip, you will always double dip. So um, they did some kind of research project um, to collect like DNA samples from the water. And so... Uh, apparently from those DNA samples, they believe that they have proven that there is no large marine life in the Loch Ness. But, you know, people describe some sort of creature that may be something like a plesiosaur, which was the other thing that I thought of as I was looking into the entire concept of these large water beasts, um... And so for those who are not familiar, a plesiosaur is a prehistoric creature. It's a type of a dinosaur. I don't remember exactly which age it is supposed to have been uh, present for, but it, uh, if I had to describe it, it kind of reminds me of like one of the long necks. Of course, I would call it that because I grew up with the lamb before time, but um, the actual name of that dinosaur is escaping me right now. But, you know, it has like a massive body, a long neck, and a tail. But instead of the land creature, it has flippers and it lives in the water. I'm pretty sure there is a uh, Scooby-Doo movie that has a plesiosaur in it. I'm going to tell you throughout this episode, I'm going to be referencing like pop culture movies because... I don't know if I just had a knack for seeing movies that it uh, pertain to this particular subject or if it's just very, very prevalent in our pop culture, but be warned, these are not, uh, they're not endorsements of said movies or shows. They're not recommendations or anything like that. Just things that I have seen, whether I would watch it again or not. Uh, is a totally different podcast episode, totally different uh, standard 
and, and conversation, but I will be talking about them because it's likely that you guys have seen these things too. Um, and I also want to point out how prevalent these ideas are in our culture today. So like I said, that was the basis that I was approaching this episode with. That's what was going on in my head. But I ended up thinking that that would make for a pretty boring show. Uh, for one, it's only three creatures. Um, I mean, I guess if I really took the time and maybe actually went to like a library or something, um, I could find a lot of good information on the origins and the histories. Um, like I said, even though Leviathan is not talked about in a great detail in the Bible, there is a lot of, of extra biblical Jewish lore and I'm not really sure where that came from um, and then of course the Loch Ness Monster has a long history and you know I actually don't know that much about plesiosaurs so it would have been you know something to learn but I felt like in the spirit of this season as we're talking about common knowledge and things that kind of span the globe I felt like it was a very limited conversation because um, you know, the Loch Ness Monster is somewhere in Europe. Leviathan would be, in, you know, in the Middle East um, and in, like, Mesopotamia area. And then, you know, plesiosaurs, I'm not sure where they lived, but I, I guess they lived all over the world. But that's more of, like, a scientific thing. It's not, like, a specific culture or anything like that. So really, we'd only be looking at two cultures and science. And that's not really the aim of this season or the thing that I had in, in mind. So I started racking my brain for like where this episode was going to go and what it was actually going to look like. And it dawned on me, I did a Bible study with a friend of mine a long time ago, like pre-COVID a long time ago. And um, in the Bible study, we ended up watching this sermon called The Marine Kingdom. And um, many of you probably have never heard of this because I have never heard like a, a mainstream pastor preach this. And guys, I, I don't even know how to like explain what I mean when I say mainstream, but I, I guess I, I'm in my mind, I mean gem generic. Um, there are a lot of topics that churches don't cover, whether it's because they're afraid it will scare them off. A lot of popular churches, you know, are into the prosperity gospel and they're really more like motivational speakers where they just tell you the happy, pretty stuff. Um, and then of course you have, you know, 501c3 complications and it basically, you know, there are things that you probably will never get from a pastor, particularly if they're getting paid by the people who are listening to them speak. Um, and so, you know, in general, I highly encourage you to study for yourself. I'm not saying that this thing about the Marine Kingdom is legit or that it's, you know, gospel, um, because anyone can preach anything. Um, as the word of God says, you will know them by their fruits. So, um, you know, always test the spirits. But we did listen to this sermon about the marine kingdom. And I have seen uh, other people kind of murmuring about it. Like I said, I have, I'm not endorsing or denying it because I haven't studied it enough to actually give it any real uh, credence. But the gist of it is that there is this concept or this belief among some Christians that um, the water houses creatures that are demonic. I think that's the most concise way that I can say it. Um, and it's interesting because if you look at the word of God, if you go into Revelation, there is a verse that says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now, earlier in Revelation, there is a definition for the sea that says, I can't remember if it says the sea or the waters are many peoples and nations and, 
and kindreds and, and tongues. So I'm not really sure if it's saying there will not be any more sea, like we won't be divided into different nations, we'll be one people. Or if this is literal, like there will be no more sea, like there won't be an ocean or like massive bodies of water or something like that. Um, but if you hear people talking about the marine kingdom, this verse will definitely come up and they'll start talking about the creatures of the deep. Um, and of course, with that, you'll get conversations about the fact that, for instance, when the earth was flooded, whatever was in the ocean probably survived, right? Because it, it lived in the water. So I was thinking about this concept of the marine kingdom. And of course, in thinking about that, I started thinking about things like Atlantis. Um, it's not quite the same concept because legend doesn't have Atlantis to be a demonic kingdom. But people are pretty obsessed with Atlantis and, you know, like this lost civilization that may have been buried under the water. Um, and as I started down, you know, the whole train of thought with Atlantis, I kind of just started thinking about the media. Like I said earlier, there are so many movies that deal with underwater creatures and legends. So of course, Disney has a movie called Atlantis. There's actually two. Um, there's Atlantis, The Lost Kingdom. I forgot what the sequel is called. And in that movie, they actually feature the Leviathan, interestingly, um, as some sort of protector of Atlantis. Um, and then I started thinking about Godzilla. Now, before you lose your mind, I know Godzilla is not a water creature. He's some sort of reptilian thing, probably closer to a dragon than anything else. Um, but one of the things that made me think of Godzilla is that, number one, according to Jewish legend, the Leviathan can like shoot lightning out of his mouth, which Godzilla can do. And also, I feel like Godzilla appears from out of the water very often. Like, I, like you see him swimming in the water, you see him rising up out of the water. So this connection of water and Godzilla just kind of popped into my head, um, and then, of course, you have the Little Mermaid, which comes out of Europe and is very popular in the West. Um, it is very much a, I guess, cutesy or uh, happy-ish version of mermaid mythology. We're going to get into that. But it's very, it's very different than what most mermaid mythology is. Um, there's also a show from Australia called H2O Just Add Water that's about regular teenage girls who turn into mermaids. Um, there is a Studio Ghibli film called Ponyo that is roughly inspired or based on The Little Mermaid, um, though I would argue it's better because Studio Ghibli is just better than Disney. Sorry, random, random aside that you guys didn't ask for. Um, I, uh, there's also a movie called Song of the Sea, which is about a Selkie, and that is a, uh, I think, Celtic or Norse um, type of a, a, a mythology, which we're going to get into. Um, and so I just thought, you know, it's very bizarre. Um, these are just the things that I thought of off the top of my head. And all of these are aimed, I guess, more for like childlike audiences, minus Godzilla, unless you're talking about the cartoon. When I was a kid, there was a cartoon Godzilla, um, which they were often, like I said, in the water. Um, but there are other movies like I, I I definitely remember some kind of like horror movie that had to do with mermaids and things as well. So I'm pretty sure there are more quote unquote adult versions of this. Um, even as I'm thinking about it, there's a movie called Aquamarine that is about mermaids. Like they're just kind of all over the place in our culture. And I thought it was interesting. I mean, it in a way, it makes sense that we would be fascinated with these sea creatures because uh, there are lots of parts of the sea that we haven't discovered, that we haven't searched. Um, I'm pretty sure if we spent as much money and effort in going into the sea, we probably could, uh, but most of that money is spent trying to get up into outer space. I don't know why because I personally would like to know what's here on the planet with us a little bit more than I would like to know about what's not on the planet with us. But nonetheless, um, 
you know, there are definitely parts of the the ocean that we haven't discovered and that we haven't looked at. Now, that being said, when you start to go further into the ocean and you start to see the creatures that live there, and there are creatures that live there, um, they look pretty creepy. They definitely do not look like Ariel from The Little Mermaid. So that definitely is interesting to me because up until recently, uh, supposedly people didn't know that. And I say supposedly because I think people from other generations may have known more than we give them credit for. But nonetheless, um, the legends of, you know, these water creatures being kind of scary and eerie and uh, mal malevolent and, and things like that. Uh, it's interesting because when you see those creatures, I get why you would make that assumption. When you see something like a clownfish, I see where you would come up with the Little Mermaid. So um, it, it kind of falls together. But, you know, let's talk about some of these legends that exist worldwide and then how they seem to be similar. So we're going to start in the Middle East. Um, of course, that is where uh, the nation of Israel was. Um, I don't I don't necessarily see anything like biblical about mermaids. Of course, like I said, we, we mentioned Leviathan as some sort of sea creature. Um, but um, there is a mermaid figure in A Thousand and One Nights, which is um, an Arabian tale. There is also um, appearances of mermaids in artwork in Mesopotamia, um, particularly after the era of like Babylon. So I think that's interesting because obviously um, the Israelites would have come into contact with some of those ideas while they were in captivity in Babylon. So that's definitely interesting. And there is also a legend about Someone named uh, Atargus? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right. But this I found to be very, very interesting because this is supposedly the mother of Semiramis. Now, if you do not know who Semiramis is, I highly advise you to start doing some research. Um, be warned, you're going to go down a rabbit hole. Uh, Semiramis is definitely the mother of like paganism essentially and um, be prepared because you're going to start to see a lot of the pagan traditions that have been inserted into Christianity. So you know if you start going down that I highly suggest you also start studying what is and is not biblical. Um, but I thought that was interesting that this does tie in here. Um, and of course, uh, this particular uh, being is also deified in Greek mythology, um, which makes sense if you understand the history of Semiramis and the fact that this concept is like the fundamental concept of all like pantheistic pagan religions. So it doesn't it, it, it doesn't surprise me that this lives on in Greek mythology. Now as you get into Europe, like I said, the Greeks um, also believed in mermaids. Uh, one thing that's interesting with the Greeks is like the concept of sirens. Now originally I believe sirens were supposed to be like half human half bird, but over time people started to think of them as like water creatures or like mermaid-ish beings. Um, and they were always very beautiful women who could sing well and lured sailors to their death, right? <laughs> uh, what else would a mermaid be doing out there in the water except trying to kill unsuspecting men? Um, another uh, versions of um, mermaids within Europe, I mentioned the Selkie, um, which is a Celtic or Norse version. Uh, Selkies don't actually, they're not actually like half human, half fish, I don't think. I think they're, they turn into like seals or something when they're in the water, and then they turn into humans on land. But there is legend and lore about them coming on land and marrying 
humans and then like having children with humans and things like that. Um, definitely this concept of intermixing. Um, there's also something called the marrow in Ireland. Um, and there's also the Melusine or Melusinae. Not really sure. My French is not good, but it is a French version of the mermaid. Now that one is interesting because you've definitely seen it. It is on the logo of a Starbucks cup. Um, it is sometimes pictured as a girl with two fish tails and sometimes it looks more like the traditional mermaid. Um, and I do believe the legend behind it is that it is like a woman who was seeking vengeance for her mother on her father and then her mother found out and punished her by turning her into that creature. Um, I think that's the legend. Um, as always, I'll be linking some links in the show notes uh, for your reference. And of course, because this is dealing with a lot of mythology, um, probably going to have like some Wikipedia links in there and things like that because let's be real, credible sources and mythology like I said, I had to spend a lot of time in the library and I really just didn't have time for that. So I just made do with what I had. But um, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, also in Europe, I guess uh, this is mainly in like the Russia, Russia, which I guess is sort of more in Asia, but it's also Slavic. So drifting some into like East Europe um, is the Rasalka which is another version of the mermaid. There are also many legends in Asia. Um, so the one that I found that was actually like named and had a specific name was the Ningoyo, um, which is in Japan. But I definitely saw information about mermaid sightings or beliefs or specific characters um within other countries be it the philippines uh thailand um china india uh there was a whole thing about like hinduism and like a particular character in hinduism that um, may or may not be a mermaid and so i thought that was interesting because they didn't seem to have like specific names for these creatures but there are still uh legends about them and really more i saw like specific names of like a specific creature um which lends a little bit more to like uh deification i'm not sure that like definitely not all of these were i guess like deities but it kind of seems like that like it was like special to a goddess or or a god of the ocean or a protector of the ocean or something like that as opposed to being um you know like a generic group of people the way we would see like a bird like birds are just everywhere there's nothing particularly special about them um they're just a species that exists and i think uh particularly like in western lore mermaids are just a species that exists it's not like um, like definitely if you think like the Little Mermaid-esque, it's not like Ariel had superpowers. Uh, Ursula had powers or magic. She was a witch. That's how Ariel became a human. But it's not like she had like some special powers or she was like a ruler of the sea or that she was immortal or anything like that. But um, the legends that I saw in Asia definitely lended to that vibe since they seem to apply to like a specific person or a specific um character so asia is on board with there's something in the water um and then of course i looked up legends in africa now the first thing i found in africa is something called mommy water um I'm pronouncing that wrong because I'm saying it very much like it's in English <laughs> let me retry that uh, Mamiwata. Uh, it 
basically translates to like mother of the water, uh, which is probably why I'm saying water instead of Wata. I'm not really sure of specific pronunciation, um, but this legend is found all throughout Africa and South Africa and Central Africa and West Africa. And of course, because it is found all over the continent of Africa and is uh, a very, very old legend and tradition, it made its way across the water and is also found in the African diaspora here in the States, in the Caribbean, in South America. Um, so I listed it under Africa because that's where it originates, but it exists everywhere. Um, and uh, when I was doing research on that, there also seems to be some ties to like, uh, like serpent behavior um, seems like it may be like a snake charmer and things like that. I've also heard a bit about this concept from my friends who are Caribbean. Um, I didn't really hear much about it in South Carolina. I grew up on the coast and that wasn't really something that I grew up hearing about. So it's probably more prevalent in the Caribbean than it is in the actual United States. Um, but I did find that interesting. There's also something called the Nyuzu um, in Zimbabwe and the Jangu in Cameroon. So uh, those were a couple of different things that I found in Africa. Those, again, these are things that are actually named, like they actually have a name for what we say is a mermaid. There were also legends that I saw that seemed to describe mermaids or that describe like a particular person or being but we're not like a generic term for like all mermaids. And of course, last but not least, we're coming back to the continent of America. Um, and I did not see anything specific to like native tribes um, in North America or Canada or anything like that, but I did find the Iara um, in Brazil which seems to resemble um, what we call a mermaid. Now, that was a lot, okay? We just basically took a whole tour of the world, touched every continent, and found that there is something that uh, people believe in that is like a mermaid. Um, and if you keep digging, I also saw things in like New Zealand. I'm pretty sure there's probably stuff in Australia that's the only continent other than Antarctica that we didn't really touch. But what I found to be interesting was the things that these all have in common. And a lot of these things go back to like a serpent nature. It They're often described as being serpentine. And even though our modern history shows it as like a fish tail. A lot of the original legends are actually like a snake tail or like a water snake or like a water moccasin type of a thing, um, which I found to be very interesting and kind of a throwback to one of the early episodes I did this season about the serpent and the dragon. Um, and I also found that interesting when you consider that like I said, there are people who believe that the marine kingdom, that there's this kingdom in, in the water that literally belongs to the devil who is the serpent. And a lot of these things do tie into um, the serpent. But they also have a tendency to be very feminine. Like, it, it seems like a common theme. Uh, obviously, we say mermaids, but there are legends about mermen as well. But mermaids seem to be more popular than mermen. And an attribute of mermaids, whether they are seen as benevolent or malevolent, um, seems to be this idea of beauty and then intertwined with that, the idea of lust. Many of these creatures represent sex and sexuality. Um, they're said to lure men, um, lure the sailors into the ocean. Some of them it's for the purpose of, you know, making the man their lover, which of course, because humans can't survive under the ocean, uh, they end up drowning and dying. Um, with the selkie, which is a little less dark, I guess, um, th the person comes onto land, but again, they, they end up intermarrying with humans, uh, which is a little weird from a biblical standpoint. Um, and a lot of these creatures have an aggression towards humans. 
uh, specifically men, but sometimes just humans in general. They seem to wreak havoc amongst us. And so I thought it was interesting because that really ties in line with the idea of them being demonic. Um, but overall, I just found it pretty interesting that everybody seems to have these uh, ideas about what's going on in the ocean and there are a lot of similar threads like many of the other topics we've talked about this year and so I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about them and wondering at uh, what that means for the, the the overall truth that can be found. Um, I would definitely say be careful diving into the ocean uh, but no but seriously um, let me know what you guys think, if there are some uh, legends that I left out, or if you are more familiar with the Marine Kingdom theory um, from Christianity, what you think about it. Anyway, see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in. Bye!